An old Cherokee is teaching his grandson about life. A fight is going on inside of me, he said to the boy. It is a terrible fight and is between two wolves. One is evil. He is anger, envy, sorrow, regret, greed, arrogance, self-pity, guilt, resentment, inferiority, lies, false pride, superiority, and ego. He continued, the other is good. He is joy, peace, love, hope, serenity, humility, kindness, benevolence, empathy, generosity, truth, compassion, and faith. The same fight is going on inside you and inside every other person too. The grandson thought about it for a minute and then asked his grandfather, which wolf will win? The old Cherokee simply replied, the one you feed. My name is Charles James. Uh, I live in Roswell, Georgia, uh, and I am a graphic designer uh, professionally, and I am starting to be an emerging artist, hopefully. Uh, that's the idea anyway. And so, uh, yeah, that's what I've been doing. So as a kid, I used to draw all the time. Uh, of course, we didn't have electronics or, or anything like that, so, you know, I'd either be outside playing or I'd be in my room uh, painting or drawing or, you know, I constantly were, was drawing uh, superheroes. I had a friend of mine that was really good at it. And so, you know, everything that we drew had capes and bolts coming out of the hands and, and things like that. So uh, that's where I started and, and loved drawing. So I, I would do it all the time. I mean, I, I my parents bought me paints and I painted. I remember painting as a, as a kid. Uh, even oil painting. We had an art uh, class and the teacher said, everybody draw your favorite character from a book you like. So I drew the cat in the hat. I used to love the cat in the hat and read all the books. And so I drew uh, a, a shot of cat in the hat's face in the hat. And then behind him was the little kid sitting at the window while it was raining because he wanted to go outside and play. So it was that little scene, and I drew that just thinking she wanted it. So I did that, handed it over, and you know, a week later or so, I get this thing that says, hey, you're, you're first place winner in the Clinton County uh, Art Contest. And I, I was like, wow. You know, I was in the second grade maybe. And that was very cool because I got my picture taken, and yeah, it was a big thing. And I got a ribbon, you know, a nice blue ribbon. So uh, yeah, it was it was a it was a shock, but it was fun, and that was my, kind of my first taste of art that it could mean something other than just to me, because I just thought it was fun to do. Something I think woke up in my head and went, "Hey, maybe you are okay at this, you know, and and maybe that means something. I don't know what it means, but maybe it means something." As a teenager, I was. Um, a, a bit shy. I mean, I had I had friends, I had good friends, and and people liked me at school, and I, I was it was okay, but I was very shy, especially towards girls. Uh, you know, when I was 13, 14, 15. As a teenager, it, normally you don't feel like you're, uh, you know, there's always something wrong, something missing, and so that's how I felt. Was was very uh, insecure about myself, and how I looked, and how I acted, and could I hold a conversation and all these things. My heart would be pounding out of my chest just to think about walking up and asking you know, that girl to go out or do anything because it's the fear of rejection. It was just too scary. I mean, I, it, was, it was too scary for me to, to do that. So it, I first started uh, to drink alcohol, I think I was 17. I may, have, I may have been 18, but I'm, I'm pretty sure it was like late 17. So, because what happened was I lived in Greenville, Mississippi. I grew up there, so I knew everybody. I knew all the girls. I'd never ask a girl out because half of them were just my friends. 
And, um, and so when we moved to Ruston, Louisiana, I thought I'm going to reinvent myself. And I remember specifically thinking that I'm going to reinvent myself. I'm going to do those things that I want to do. I'm going to go to parties and ask girls out and drink and smoke and whatever I want to do. As soon as I took that first drink, my brain went, that's it. That's what you need right there. Go get some more of that. You know, keep doing that. I mean, I thought I want to stay buzzed forever because I, I remember thinking that. I would just, I want to stay with this feeling forever because I don't feel insecure. I don't feel ugly. I don't have any of those feelings. I just feel great and I'm not afraid to do it. I'm Superman. I was an alcoholic immediately. I went to drink to feel good and to drink more and more and more and more. It wasn't anything, you know, drinking to me, that's what drinking was, was to, to feel that way. I was searching for that and I wanted more of it. So when I was, um, we were 18 and we had just graduated high school, my buddy and I went out to all the parties that night and drank our brains out. Uh, we went out, we did all the parties, had all the drinks. I was hammered on Jack Daniels. I kind of remember the car ride home. I slept at his house, uh, woke up in the morning, it was Sunday morning, and his mother um, had to go to church, so she had to use the car. So she gets in the car, and I vomited all in the passenger side. So yeah, it was, it was uh, not a good scene. Uh, she let me have it too. She knew exactly what happened and what, you know, I mean, it was easy to see. As she's, she's not cursing me out because she was a church going lady, but everything but. Um, I think the, the worst thing that I felt was, it was shame and, and embarrassment, but you know, she was calling me a low life. And that was, that's pretty, that, especially when you're 18 years old, your confidence level is not the highest in the world. So. When an adult calls you a low life, that's pretty bad. So as I grew uh, into, um, um, you know, got close to 30, I, Kathy and I got married. And um, so we met each other. She was a client. I was working at an advertising agency. And we met and we kind of got together one night on Bill Street. So we were at a big party on Bill Street. And uh, so we, we got together kind of in the party mode. And we got married. Uh, we had Nicholas, our uh, firstborn. And, you know, we did all the things that every other family does. Um, going on trips and things with him. And then we adopted a girl, uh, Sydney, my daughter. So uh, we would go on vacations together and do like every other family would do. Uh, the only difference is with me, I had to always kind of find a time that I could get some alcohol. Make sure you go to this restaurant or this thing because I know I can sit down and have a beer. I did work my uh, getting a drink in any time I could. Well, if I went to a party or whatever, I definitely would have some drinks before I went. And because it just loosens you up and you can talk about things and you're meeting people for the first time and some people are talkers and some people are not and you have to kind of pull it out. So I just said, well, I'm just going to be buzzed and it's going to be fine. Everything's fine. So I did, I used alcohol to, as a social lubricant. That's what I did. So I used to work um, at an advertising agency and I've worked at a couple of um, agencies and design shops uh, before I started working for myself. So I was not painting. I had not picked up a paintbrush since college where I had all the art classes. Uh, I had basically been doing things on a computer. I've been doing logos and brochures and corporate collateral. But no, I, I, have, I did not paint or draw or anything. I completely dropped any kind of physical artwork. You know, once I hit kind of 50, uh, I did notice a, a big weight gain. I mean, I've always gained weight because I've always had too much to drink. And on top of that, then you eat poorly. But in the last five years, let's say, I, you know, my blood pressure was through the roof. The doctors were telling me, you have to, and I would tell them, uh, I drink every day, and I would tell them how much I drink. I didn't go in and lie and say, oh, I just have two, when I know that's bullshit. 
So I went in and I'd tell them, okay, I drink every day. I drink probably a few bottles of wine a day, plus whatever I go out and have if we go out to eat or whatever. So at one point, I started turning yellow. And so I thought, uh-oh, well, now I've done it. I tried to manage it, I couldn't, and but I literally turned yellow. I thought my liver was going out. The doctor thought my liver was going out. We thought this was it. I lost weight, I couldn't eat, I slept all day. It was terrible. And finally, one of the doctors said, well, that could be the problem uh, that your liver's going out, but there could be this other issue, which is a blocked bile duct. So he checked for that, he did two scans. Second scan he did that, called me that night and said, that's it, we're operating tomorrow. Because I was that close to going into sepsis, I think it's called. And because uh, I, I, I was completely yellow, my eyeballs were yellow, I thought I was dying of liver failure. So an embarrassing moment uh, during all this with my daughter Sydney, um, and I didn't realize this at the time, honestly, but uh, I, that day I had been drinking all day. I've been working at my desk here at my home office, and I think this was summer, so she was at home. And it, during the day, I guess, I had had some downtime, and I put my head on the desk and just went to sleep. Basically passed out, because I had, I'm sure I'd been drinking from the morning on. So this is probably three o'clock in the afternoon, maybe. And she came by with her phone and filmed me sleeping with my head on the desk. And so I didn't know about this until later. And she came and showed it to me and said, look, you fell asleep uh, outside. So, and of course I didn't say, well, I was drunk. I was like, yeah, I, I haven't been sleeping well. And you know, it was, there was always an excuse like that. But uh, it was very embarrassing because I knew what would happen. Uh, honestly, I'm not sure to this day she knew why I was asleep, but it was, it was embarrassing to have your daughter film you blacked out. For one thing, drinking all the time makes you have to go to the bathroom all the time. So you usually have to pee or other things. Well, um, I, at this point, I was starting to lose control of my bowel movements. So I had to honestly be careful about when and where and how far I went. And so we were on a hike one day and I literally had to stop. This is a public place. Make sure there was nobody around and go into the woods and take care of business. So, you know, that was a, that was a terrible, uh, kind of a disgraceful, sad moment. And that's what made me realize, okay, this is way out of control. You can't, you can't even go on a hike without having to stop and do something like that. So I come downstairs, I go, I cannot do this anymore, I give up. I knew I needed to go to rehab. So we call the Bluff Plantation, we had already kind of looked it up, and they said, how about today? I drink the entire way there, and I find out later that that's absolutely normal, and the people that, tell, that I'm going to say, stay on whatever routine you're doing. So drank all the way there, Drove up the driveway, get out, big plantation house, walk in. It is the weirdest thing in the world. You, you start to go, where have I gone wrong? How did I end up here? They had lots of uh, therapies, lots of different things that you did, starting from about eight o'clock in the morning. And one of those was exercise therapy and yoga therapy, things like that. So they're, they're trying to incorporate the mind and the body together during this. So there was more than just counseling that you sit down and talk about your feelings. It was about life and getting back into life and all those things that you kind of put on to the side from drinking. Well, one of our therapy sessions, and we had this a few times, was to have art therapy. And, you know, I thought, well, that must be right up my alley because that's kind of what I do for a living or what I've been interested in, but I hadn't done anything in a while. So, and so they gave us some paper plates and some markers and things like that and said, make a mask, 
do the outside as what you're showing to everyone and write something on there that you want to portray. And then on the opposite side, write all the things that you are masking for you. I haven't drawn in so long. I thought, well, I'm just going to make a clown. But my clown ended up kind of, kind of being the scary clown of, of uh, the Joker. But then I wrote happy right across the front because I kind of a jokester when I meet people. I try to make people laugh and do these kind of things. And then on the opposite side, I had my anxiety, my depression, uh, my feeling infer uh, inferior to people or to things. Spiritually bankrupt. Yeah, I had just been dead inside. So that mask really woke me up to go, wow, it was powerful in the message, but it was also, it got me to draw and paint and cut and do things. And, but I got to pick up watercolor brush again. I got to pick up pastel markers again and do all these things, cut construction paper, kind of like being a kid again. And so that really, uh, that, ten that tended to wake something up in me. I feel. I figured that, you know, that it was kind of like what alcohol had done to me when I was younger. That's what you need. Art just came back to me at that moment because I haven't done it in so many years that I thought that's that gives me the same kind of feeling as, uh, as the alcohol did. It's what I needed. At, when I was coming out, I told Kathy, my wife, um, I think I want to start painting and drawing and things again because it, I, I told her about the art therapy. And she said, that's awesome. I think that's a great idea. She and a friend cleared a bedroom out for me, took the bed out, took all the furniture out, made it my art studio. So as soon as I got home, we went, got all the art supplies, paints and things that I didn't have anymore. And I started to just draw and paint and things. You know, if I saw something and I wanted to do it, I tried it. And so if you've been following me on Facebook or you've been seeing, and maybe you'll see some stuff in, in this, uh, you'll see that it's all over the place. I'm doing acrylics, I'm doing acrylic pours, I'm doing watercolors, pen and ink, digital uh, work on the iPad and Procreate. Uh, so that's kind of how I started. And I just started drawing things just to draw them for no other reason. Um, collage, paper collage, assemblage art, which is, you know, random pieces that you put together and then you take apart and it's only art for one second. So it's like being in school again. It's like being a kid again. And that's the way I'm treating it as part of my recovery. So when I got out of rehab in Augusta, uh, I came here to Atlanta and went into outpatient in, uh, therapy. And during my sessions, we would have sessions most of the day and until about 3.30. Um, they, one of the things they gave us was the story of the two wolves, an old Cherokee story. And so when they, they passed us out a piece of paper and one of us read through it, it may have even been me actually. And uh, at the end of that, after I read the little story, I thought, man, that, is, that hits the nail on the head. Most of the time I think we don't think about what we're feeling and, and how things are inside and that there's a good and the bad part. And this story really kind of brings it to the forefront. It brings it in your mind to the forefront going, oh yeah, you need to, you need to feed the good things inside of you and be positive because if you're constantly feeding that negative wolf, negative things are gonna happen. And so that was, that, that's why it kind of really hit me is like, it made me think about being positive and acting positive and thinking positive and being positive towards myself, not just to other people, but you have to be kind to yourself. One of the first um, acrylic paintings I did when I got home was a cross. It was a cross being pulled out of the ooze just a black tar looking ooze and the cross is very rustic and beaten and worn and it's being pulled up out of that. I'm not particularly religious, but for some reason that came to me as an, something I wanted to express and I wanted to get it out of me and onto the canvas. So I did this and the, the painting has about that much acrylic on there. There's so much that I did to that painting to get it to look the way it does. 
And it, that particular thing had a meaning to me because I was being pulled up out of the depths of wherever I was out of that. And the, that made a lot of sense to me. Sometimes the art can be abstract or, or you know, painterly or things like that, and they kind of have a meaning or they don't, and they have composition, but some things definitely have a meaning, definitely have an iconistic value to it. So one of my favorites uh, that I've done like that as an illustration would be Mother's Love. And I put a tree and lots of room under that for the earth with the tree's roots going into a heart. And so I call that Mother's Love. And that particular one uh, came to me, not only for, you know, Mother Earth, but just the feeling I had for my mother and, and you know, who I've become based on my parents and my mother. And so that particular painting as an illustration, an icon, uh, really was important to me. I'm doing like every artist in the world does, or everybody does. You, you find things that you like, you, you take things from other artists that you like, and you make them your own. You take those pieces and parts. So I'm finding techniques and colors and the way people put things together and ideas and going, oh, that gives me an idea to do something. And so, you know, lately I've had just an explosion of art. Painting and drawing and all that is very expressive. So you can express your feelings. And if you notice, if you notice when you see my work, a lot of it's very abstract. And I'm not specifically talking about one thing. It's more about how I feel at the moment, how the paint goes down on the canvas, the motions that I am taking. Some of it is I'll look at an artist that I like, see some techniques that they have, and do, do my version of whatever that is, trying their techniques and my expression. So I found that when I started to do these paintings and these drawings and things, um, I felt very calm and centered like I hadn't felt in a long time. The negativity and the insecurity and all those kind of things just kind of went away. Um, Especially, you know, insecurity when you show somebody something, they go, oh man, that's amazing. You know, that right there really kind of, you know, lets you know that, oh, you are good at something. You are good at this. You know, my, my feelings on this is that I want to help people um, realize that they're not alone, that um, this is very common thing that happens and not to be embarrassed or anything like that you need some help get some help that's what you need to do and and if you got to get out and spend all your money on paints like I did and and paint your way out of this that's what I'm doing I'm painting my way out of alcoholism <laughs> and so that's I want to pay it forward by showing people what I'm doing showing them that you know uh, a career alcoholic, if, if I can do it, anybody can do this. You know, uh, people find this interesting, they find it helpful, it raises questions, they'll call and get help if they're even thinking that they may have a problem. Uh, they'll help another person. If somebody says, man, I, I am just stuck and I don't know how to get out of this, um, help them. And that's what I want to do and that's what I want to be available for uh, to anyone. So. The Good Wolf uh, plays a huge uh, part in my recovery because I, without realizing it, I think I had always been negative and thinking negative and thinking negatively about myself. And that little story uh, really reminded me not to do that, to actively talk and think good thoughts. The, the wolf that wins is the wolf you feed. If you feed the bad wolf, that's gonna, uh, you're gonna have those negative thoughts and emotions and, and all the bad things. You worry about feeding that good wolf. You, you feed the positive things. You talk to yourself in a positive way. Um, you know, make a gratitude list. Might seem silly. Make a gratitude list and think about all the things you're happy about. Even if it's eating tacos today, that's positive. You can train your brain, you can work this in your brain and and dig your soul out of these depths by
feeding that good wolf. And so that, that, uh, that story really gets to me and uh, makes a lot of sense. And if I could, you know, pass that on and show somebody this and, um, and they go, wow, I never thought about it that way or they take anything away, of, you know, about being positive and helping somebody else out. And, and uh, you know, that's, that's why I'm doing this. I want to tell my story and uh, you're not alone and you take action, take action with uh, this issue and, and you can get out of this. So feed the good wolf.